What's going on everybody? Welcome to this episode of Home Built Workshop. Today we've got kind of a mixed bag of different skills. We're going to do some woodworking. We are going to do some buffing and polishing of some metal. We're even going to include some 3D printing all together to build this really cool saddle stand. Stick around, check it out. My daughter is really into horses. Pretty much anything you can imagine that has to do with horses, she loves it, including horseback riding. And with horseback riding, there's a lot of different pieces of tack that goes along with it for different purposes, but the main one really is the saddle. Now a saddle's kind of a big thing and you can't just throw it in a heap on the floor until you need it next time. So you gotta take care of these things and this saddle stand is a perfect way to store a saddle in between uses. This is gonna be something that she's gonna be able to use for a long time and I think it's gonna be a great project. To build this thing, I'm gonna use all elm that I milled up with my chainsaw mill. Now I've got quite a few that are these smaller pieces that are going to work great for some of these smaller dimensions that we need to cut, but some of them are still in larger slab form. These larger slabs, you could totally break these down with a straight edge and a circular saw. I've done that quite a few times. It does work, it takes a little bit of time and effort, but I think to speed this process up, we're gonna run this up the road to my local hardwood dealer, JW Hardwoods in Peyton, Colorado. Out at JW, they have the full array of woodworking and millwork machines, including this Madison Straight Line Ripsaw. This thing is awesome. I think the power feed alone has a three horsepower motor. This thing just eats through whatever you put through it. And while we were at the wood shop, I also had them run these boards through their big industrial planer. This saved me a ton of time and a lot of wear and tear on my tiny little lunchbox planer. I did run a few boards through my own planner once I got them home, but they were the smaller ones. After getting these all straight line ripped and planed down to thickness, both at JW and finishing up the small pieces on my little planer, I have got a bunch of pieces here now ready to go. I need to do a lot of trimming. There's still some cracks and defects in these boards that I know I'm going to need to cut away. It's kind of why I prepared a lot more than I know I'm going to need because I know I'm going to lose some of that as I start cutting out the cracks and some of the bad knots and things. Now just in case some of you guys are wondering why in the world would you take this somewhere, pay somebody to have this stuff milled up when you could do it yourself and that is a completely valid question and yes I could straight line these with a straight edge and a circular saw and then spend a ton of time on my little planer planing these things down but really the bottom line comes down to time savings the equipment at the mill shop is much higher quality much heavier duty than what I have here in my little shop my little planer would take forever because I have to take such small cuts to try to get this stuff plane down out there at the mill shop, I can run this through the planer and it can take off this material in no time. It's a lot more accurate too. I don't have to deal with quite so much snipe and really it's just time savings. It's so much faster to do it. And for me, that cost is worth it in the time that I'm gonna save. I would spend hours doing this myself. I can take it out there and really have it done in no time. It's one of those processes that you have to weigh the pros and cons, the cost versus the time savings and determine if it's gonna work for you. But for this especially, it's totally worth it for me to save hours and hours of my time by having it done out there. I've got my rough drawn plan here with my handwritten cut list. Let's get started. First up, I'm gonna run all of these pieces on my joiner to make sure I have nice flat and square edges for the table saw. Now begins the somewhat long process of turning these boards that still have mostly one live edge into usable lumber. I've got to trim a lot of stuff away working around cracks and splits in order to get everything usable and solid. In a lot of ways, I feel that working with rough sawn lumber like this is more difficult than going to the lumber yard and buying already dimensioned lumber. At the lumber yard, at least you know the width you're going to get is going to be consistent. With material like this, you don't really know what you're going to get. Not every piece is the same. I spent a lot of time before I started making these cuts trying to figure out which board is going to give me the best piece for this project since I have a random assortment of widths I try to utilize these the best I can. Of course, the upside is once you've put in all the work and you've made a completed piece from wood that you've milled, it is so satisfying. 
Well, that was a lot of work, but now I have a ton of pieces all cut, milled to size. Everything is already dimensioned, except for a couple final cuts that we're going to make a little bit later. So now I'm ready to jump in and start doing some glue-ups. I've got the first two panels laid out here. These are going to become the top slats of this stand. These are going to get reinforced with biscuits, so first I'm going to mark out the location of the biscuits. And now we'll fire up the biscuit joiner and make some more dust. I think it's kind of law that since I'm using biscuits, that I say something about gravy. It's like a law. Section 12, Article 13, or something like that. <laughs> biscuits and gravy. It's really, really important that you secure your piece well. First couple times I ever used biscuits, this was quite a while ago, I didn't really hold the board in place very good. Actually, I've done this, I think, twice, the first couple of times. I didn't secure it to the table so that it cannot move. What happens, if you think you're gonna be able to just hold it and push, as soon as that cutter hits your piece of wood, it sends it flying very dangerously away from you. And you could really, really get hurt or hurt something that way. So really important, secure your piece, whether you clamp it, hold downs, something to keep it in place from moving when you're making the biscuit cuts. And now we glue. In order to try to save a little bit of time, I'm going to glue up both of these pieces at the same time using the same setup. I just have to be careful not to glue the middle boards together. Alright, so now with this clamped up, I'm just going to let this dry for a bit so that I can move on. Now I've got another panel that I need to glue up, but unfortunately I don't really have a good spot to set this while I'm working on the next glue up. It's a little bit bigger, two larger panels, so I'm just going to let this dry so that I can remove the clamp, set it off to the side, and begin working on the next one. This is just one of the challenges of having a small shop. I've got the pieces back here ready to go, but I don't really have a good spot to stage this where it can stay nice and flat. I don't have another table that I can set this on so that I can work on the next set of glue-ups. Not really a big deal, but like I said, one of the challenges of a small shop. Once the glue has dried enough to hold securely, but not completely dry, I'm going to scrape off all the glue squeeze out so that I can set this panel aside to move on with the others. A quick word of caution, don't scrape this stuff onto the floor. You'll end up stepping on it and tracking it into the house, and it doesn't go over well. Trust me on this one. Now with those panels out of the way and my bench top back, I can now cut some more biscuit slots and glue up the other two remaining panels. This panel is cut to the exact length, so I'm trying to make sure that the edges are lined up really well. We're going to do some trimming on this side, so it's not going to be a super big deal, but I definitely want the bottom to be nice and even, so just a rubber mallet to adjust it. Clamp it. You know that guy? And there's one of our end panels. We got one more to glue up. With the last panel ready to glue up, I noticed one issue. There's one glue joint here where this board kind of has a little bit of a bow or something in there. It just doesn't fit all that great. We need to address that before moving on, really because I don't know if I can get enough clamping pressure to squeeze that together. So we need to fix that up. Now you may or may not have seen this method before, but it works really well. I use it all the time if I need to get some glue joints to fit nicely. I use it for gluing guitar bodies. Anytime you need a really, really nice glue joint, here's how you do it. So I'm gonna get this one out of the way. This is the glue joint that we need to fix. 
The way we're going to run this on the jointer is we're going to fold this up just like a book. And now we can run on the jointer together like this. This method works really good, mainly because when you fold them up book match style, any inconsistencies in your jointer fence, if you have any, if it's cutting at somewhat of an angle on one piece, it's going to be cutting at an opposite angle on the other piece once you fold them back down, and that's going to make them end up being nice and flat when you glue them up. this done today. I was shooting for that. That's one thing I always try when I'm trying to rush a glue up. A lot of it, especially in the wintertime, is based on the temperature. And right now it's cold outside, but it's warm enough in here that I can shut the heat and everything off. And I think it's going to stay plenty above freezing so this glue can dry before it really gets below freezing in here. So it's good. After letting these pieces dry overnight, I'm going to give them all a good sanding, make sure everything is nice and smooth and even. Now on these front and back panels, I need to mark out a couple spots where I can cut a couple 30 degree angles to kind of make a point on the top of this that's going to allow the top boards to sit at an angle. Now there are several ways you can mark out a 30 degree angle. Probably the quickest and easiest that comes to mind is to just grab a speed square, mark it out, make the cut, and you're pretty much done. But since I have been learning 3D printing, I made a 30 degree angle. The main reason I wanted to make my own was really just I'm practicing modeling every chance I get and I'm learning new skills and new parts of the software every single time. So I thought this would be kind of a fun thing just to make a quick 30 degree angle to help me mark out these angles. After printing out my angled square, I just need to find the middle of my panel, then I can use the square to mark the angle. I guess I shouldn't call it a square because it's not really square though. Now one little flaw with my little 3D printed square is I didn't make it so that I could flip it around and do the other angle. That's okay, I'm going to stick these two pieces together, we'll make one cut and then I'll just mark it out again on the back side to make the second cut. By flipping the pieces on edge I can use the tabletop to help align the edges to make sure everything's nice and even. Now I'll very carefully make that cut using my circular saw. Hey look, it's a triangle. So now I can set these parts aside while we work on the legs. Now what I need to do on the legs is really just cut out a profile on here just to kind of make this look like, well, more than a block of wood. To do that, I'm going to stick these together with double-sided tape. We'll sketch out some sort of a profile with a little relief cut in the bottom to kind of create a couple of separate legs. And then we can remove the waste at the bandsaw. I'm going to make a couple of measurements on the pieces just so I can keep my curves symmetrical. And then using a flexible steel ruler, I'll just bend it to the shape that I want and trace out the line. Now I'll use the oscillating spindle sander to remove any bandsaw marks. So now with the feet done, the edges are still nice and square, I want to lay out to drill a couple of holes where I'm going to attach these with some screws. Now these are going to get mounted to the side panels 
with some glue, something around this orientation, but I want to reinforce that with some screws that I'm going to cover with some kind of cool plugs. We're going to plug that hole. Now, I guess in hindsight, I should have done this while they were both stuck together. I could have just drilled some pilot holes and then they would match exactly, but it's not going to be too hard to lay this out. Now I've got a box laid out. This is where everything is going to get attached. There's going to be a decorative piece right here in the dead center. We've got that marked out. Now I just need to measure the same distance down, the same distance across from each corner to lay out my four screw locations. Now because of the way I'm going to plug these holes later on, I can't just go to the drill press and run some pilot holes all the way through there. That's going to cause me some issues later because what I'm going to use for plugs are these spent bullet shell casings. These are some 44 Magnum sent to me by my good friend Jody. Jody, thank you so much. I knew these were going to come in handy. I appreciate it. These are going to get inserted into the screw hole as a decorative cap for the screw. It's gonna look really awesome. So that's why I can't just drill a hole through. I need to actually drill three holes to make this work. If we look just a little bit closer at the casing, the rim at the top is just a little bit larger than the rest of the casing. I want the top to sit nice and flush with the wood, so I need to cut a very shallow recess for this rim to fit down in. I've measured this to be about half inch, so I need to first drill a very shallow half inch hole. Then I'm gonna drill just a little bit smaller hole for the casing about halfway or so through the piece of wood. From there, I'll be able to drill the screw hole. That's gonna sit the screw down in the wood and leave us some room to pound this casing down in there, but I'll need to shorten these up first. Did you get all that? Hopefully that makes sense, how we're gonna inset these as a screw cover. We're now ready to head over to the drill press. Oh. In the middle, it's not gonna get one of these shell casings, that's just gonna get a pilot hole. First, we'll drill the shallow half inch recess, followed by a slightly smaller hole that goes about halfway through the piece of wood. From there, we'll just drill our normal sized pilot hole. give those pieces a quick sanding to smooth everything out, followed by a little bit of hand sanding to break the edges, smooth the corners. I'm going to do this to all of the pieces for the project. For a few of them, this is going to be the easiest time to sand it. Once we start putting it together, I won't be able to get to all of the places quite as easy. Now with most of the sanding out of the way, we can now move on to some of the assembly, starting with the feet. We're going to get them connected to the front and back panels. I'll first apply some glue to the leg piece, then I'll use a spacer block to hold the larger panel while I clamp them in place. The spacer block will make sure that I get both sides at the exact same height. I'll take a couple quick measurements just to make sure that the pieces are centered and adjust as necessary. I'm going to do the exact same thing for the second side, then I'll let the glue dry before I insert the screws. So right now I'm sticking the two side pieces together with some double sided tape. I'm going to sketch on about the same curve that the leg pieces have, and then we're going to cut that out at the bandsaw. I'm going to put a quick round over on the top edge of these pieces. These pieces are the sides of the lower storage shelf and I want the edges to be nice and smooth in case you hit your arm or hand or something on there when you're reaching in. I'm going to attach the sides to the front and back with the exact same series of drilled holes. Here's my kind of wacky glue setup, but it's going to work great. I've got the uprights held up using a couple of hand screw clamps just to keep everything standing up where I need it. On the bench, I have these exact same spacer blocks that I used when I glued the feet to the uprights. That's gonna space the side panels exactly the same height as the side pieces as well. We'll just apply just a little bit of glue, clamp it all together, and then we can attach the screws and move on. All right, 
Here's the true test. That is square. While waiting for that glue to dry, I'm gonna head over to the drill press and drill some more recesses for the boards that'll be the top. And now it's back to the sides to install the screws. All right. And now with the main box constructed, I now know the exact final dimensions so I can now cut the slats to the correct size. Then over at the drill press router table, I round over all the edges and then drill the same recessed holes in all of the slats as well as the support for the slats. And it is at this point in the project where those of you that have a very small workshop can probably relate. As a project like this starts coming together, you have less and less room to set things because, well, the project is taking up most of your workspace. <laughs> Good thing we're almost done. So right now, we gotta get these cleats attached. Those are gonna go right here. Then we can attach the slats across the bottom. Now we can stand this dude up and install our slats. These slats go in super easy. Just line them up, run some screws. Now there's a little something I didn't quite think. The screw is too close to the edge and hitting that. Saved by the right angle drill attachment. I can't very well get a good shot of this without being in the way of the camera. So you can just watch me struggle with these screws for a few minutes. This thing does make it a little bit easier. I'll tell you what though, this does come in very handy. It's one of those tools that you don't use hardly ever, at least I don't, but when you need it for certain times, it really saves the day. And to space out the rest of these slats, I've cut a couple of spacer blocks that I can use in between them to help keep the distance the same. My spacer blocks I had to adjust a little bit with a few thicknesses of masking tape. <laughs> Who cut these things anyway? So this has been one of the areas where I've kind of been struggling a little trying to figure out how I'm gonna do this. I don't have a good way to clamp these in place so that I can run some screws down through here. But I think if I just go slow and kind of work one screw at a time, I think I can get one in place on either side, which will hold it, then I can attach the rest. These two pieces are not going to butt up against each other right down the center. There's gonna be a little bit of a gap. So I believe what I'm going to do is measure down equal distances from the point That'll give me a line to line up the tops. Then I can hold it in place, install one side with a screw, then I should be good to go. you've all been waiting for. Now I get to finish sanding. Can you hear me crying from there? Are we done yet? Can we apply the finish now? And with all of that fun sanding out of the way, we can finally give this a final wipe down just to remove any excess dust before we begin applying the finish, which is going to be this homebrew finish, which is a mixture of polyurethane, mineral spirits, and boiled linseed oil. It just wipes on. It's gonna take me a little while to get it all wiped on this, but I really like the way this works. Really easy to apply. It looks really good too. Make sure lid's on tight and gently shake well before using. 
Here we go. So that wraps up the second coat of finish applied to the stand. Look, I still sort of have a little bit of a glove left. Not much, but some of it's still there. <laughs> if you guys are interested in seeing how I make this finish, I've got a specific video. I'll put a link down below in the description. Overall, I applied two coats of this. Now we need to set this aside to dry so we can begin working on the inserts that are going to fill all these screw holes. I'm excited about this part. Now, like I mentioned, I'm going to use these empty shell casings to turn into caps for these screws, but they're kind of dull and tarnished. We need to take care of that. I've kind of got a process set up to get these polished up and cut to size. First up, I'm going to use the buffer to polish these nice and shiny. That way I can take advantage of them being a little bit longer. I've got a dowel here that I've ground down to fit over the casing. Now I'm going to use this super high-tech jig, which is made from, well, just a scrap of wood from this stand. I've got a couple recesses drilled in here. Close that up. Since these are brass, I can cut these over at the bandsaw to remove most of the material. And then on the bell grinder, we'll just sand it nice and flush. Once I sand it to the thickness of this board right here, it's going to be exactly the thickness that I need to plug these screw holes. Pretty cool, huh? Now I just need to repeat that process about 38 more times until I have enough of these things made to plug all of these holes. To install these, it's really simple. I'll just tap them in the hole and make sure they're set nice and flush using a brass punch. The brass punch is just soft enough to not damage the shiny brass cartridge. That's cool. I like it. There's just one last section to do. That worked out really well, and that looks so awesome. It's such a snug fit. I'm not really worried about them popping out. I wasn't sure if I was going to have to maybe put a little epoxy or CA glue or something in there, but they fit really good. I think they're going to be just fine. Now you may be wondering what this last hole is for. Well, that is for these little conchos that I got. Now these are typically for use in leather projects, saddles and that sort of thing. But you can get an adapter that converts it from a Chicago screw thread to kind of a wood screw thread. So I thought that would be kind of cool to install these right here, kind of in the middle of all of this. The problem that I ran into is since these are still made for leather, when you screw this on, there's no screwdriver tip or any, any way to really tighten it up. So I had to get a little bit creative. Enter again, the 3D printer. I modeled this star in Fusion 360 and then basically modeled the negative so that this would fit in the inside of that star. And now I could use this as a wrench. Now I've drilled this hole a little bit larger than you normally would for a wood screw. It's going to make it thread in a little bit easier. I don't want to risk breaking this off 
or anything like that. So it's just a, a size larger than you normally would drill it. I'm just gonna use this as my wrench and install it. I think it's gonna work great. Yeah, another way you can integrate 3D printing into whatever project you're working on. This is a woodworking project, but now it involves 3D printing. <laughs> I think this is one of those things that you can integrate in whatever project you're working on. You can use it for some sort of a jig, for a tool, for a fixture, for a router guide. I'm really finding a ton of uses for this, even if you're mainly a woodworker. There still might be a place on your bench for a 3D printer. You just never know. Oh, the wrench works awesome. That worked really good. And now there's really only a couple things left to install, one of them being this pair of horseshoe hook hangers that my brother and I made a while back in a previous video. I'll put a link in the description. These are gonna get mounted on the inside and they're gonna be super handy for hanging little pieces of tack or whatever might need to be hung up in there. And of course we can't forget a lucky horseshoe just for fun. And let's give this thing a test run and see how it works. Sweet, it even holds a saddle. Almost like it was meant to do that. Between the horseshoes and the shiny brass accents, I really love the look of this thing. Well guys, there you have it. We have come to the end of yet another project here at Home Built Workshop. I could not be happier with the way this thing turned out. I love the way the wood and the metal accent bits all came together. It just looks really cool and I cannot wait to see the years of service that this thing has ahead of it. I also enjoyed getting creative with some 3D printed items and helping me build this thing. For me, this is kind of how I envisioned 3D printing being utilized, at least in my shop, being able to make custom squares and tools and different things like that to help with whatever the project is you're working on seems really handy and I'm looking forward to learning a lot more ways that I can utilize 3D printing. And guys, I wanna hear from you down below in the comments. What are your thoughts on this project? Go ahead and leave them down there. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. I have like 800 pencils in here. They're all dull. Good thing I have a pencil sharpener. That is the wobbliest drill bit I have ever seen. Look at that thing. Sorry about that. I was just gonna say how happy I am that I have gloves, but <laughs> they're full of holes. They're not even gonna last very long. So when you see me wearing no gloves in a minute, you'll know why. These are full of holes. Look it. <laughs> Here I was gonna be all proud because I actually had gloves. Ah. Screws. Where are they? <laughs>